Hello, thanks for joining me today. My name is Samuel Winsett. I'm the Way in Motion and ITS coordinator uh, for Cardinal Scale. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit today about Cardinal's Way in Motion scale. We've been making commercial truck scales, static scales, for more than 50 years. But the Way in Motion is not new to us either. Um, Cardinal began manufacturing Way in Motion scales in the 90s, uh, nearly 20 years ago. The good thing for our customers and our dealers is that our slow speed Way in Motion scale uses the same load cells and indicator um, as our standard truck scales. So these are load cells and indicators that are already familiar um, to, our, to our dealers and customers. Now while there's currently no manufacturers of way in motions that are legal for trade, and that's not a drawback of Cardinal, that's true of every WIM manufacturer out there. Frankly, there is just not a way in motion scale that can meet the in-tep tolerances. Um, so if the customer needs a scale that's legal for trade, we just need to get that out of the way right up front. Uh, this scale will not work in that application, but the SWIM does a very good job of filling a niche uh, for customers who can sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for the sake of um, saving space, uh, installation time, uh, and money. Some applications where the SWIM uh, really shines are freight terminals, um, users wanting to monitor what's, uh, what kind of uh, loads are coming on or off their property, uh, commercial fleet um, axle weighing. So let's say that you own a bottling company and you're uh, dispatching commercial trucks from your facility out onto the state roads. Well, state and federal highways are enforced uh, with legal gross and axle limits. Um, those fines can get pretty steep if that driver goes out and gets stopped at a way station and is overweight. So uh, SWIM provides an opportunity for the user to check way his vehicle before he enters uh, the public roads. Mining and rock quarries um, use this application for monitoring how much product is leaving their quarry. New regulations for overseas shipping. Uh, the regulations are called SOLOS. And um, what that regulation is, is that the overseas shipping company uh, now has to check weigh the gross weights of the containers before they load them on the ship. It used to be they would take the driver's word for it hey, this container is X number of pounds, they would record that and load it on the ship. Uh, new regulations due to uh, some issues with the ships turning over at sea because they were loaded top heavy, new regulations have dictated that uh, those containers must be check weighed for accuracy before they're loaded on the ship. Again, it's not a legal for trade application, but it is a check weighing application for this scale really, really shines. Agricultural applications, uh, the farmer might want to know how much product is coming out of the field and into his silos. Also, sorting and pre-screening. Um, you're seeing 100 vehicles a day and you don't have time to weigh them all statically. The SWIM could be uh, deployed on the ramp to the static scale and only vehicles that were suspiciously close or truly overweight uh, in their whim rating would be directed to go to the static scale for a true static weighment. The so first ad advantage of the weigh in motion scale is just purely its size. It's got a very small footprint. The lower frame itself, um, which is what supports the weigh bridge, is 13 feet 9 inches by 3 feet 1 inch. It's only about 15 inches deep. 
So you don't need very much space um, to install this scale, which is an advantage if you have a situation where, like at a shipping port, they're right on the ocean, they might not have room or drainage for a full-size truck scale. This is what the scale looks like when it leaves our facility. Um, everything you see there is manufactured right here at the Cardinal plant in Web City. You'll see here the lower frame uh, has the C channel uh, welded on the outside. The way this scale is installed is that the way bridge is lifted out of the scale leaving just the solid steel welded lower frame. That lower frame is suspended over a pit which the installer excavates. <clears throat> the installer will excavate a pit that's about 16 feet by 5 feet. They'll suspend the scale over the pit with some leveling beams that will be supplied by Cardinal with the scale. He'll install the conduit and the drainage required and then he'll pour the concrete around the scale and basically cast the scale into place. Once the scale um, concrete has cured, the installer installs the four SCA load cells and the way bridge, terminates the load cells at an 825 indicator, all things that our dealers are already familiar with doing, and then simply starts the um, normal static calibration of the scale like they would a typical static truck scale. Once the scale is calibrated statically, you switch the indicator to dynamic weighing mode and can start weighing. You'll notice here on this slide, the weigh bridge is 12 feet long. And if you remember, I said the lower frame is 14 feet long. Uh, there's a reason for that, and that is that for the convenience of the scale tax, we've installed a one-foot access panel at both ends of the scale. Those access panels are going to allow, here's a picture, are going to allow the user or scale tech to simply remove the panel and from there he can easily access the checking and the load cells can also visually inspect the pit or wash it out if needed. Here's an in view of the scale. This is uh, just a cutaway of the, of the short end of the scale. You can see here the checking and two load cells. Again, this is the sort of scale we're already familiar with um, from our static applications. The unique thing about the scale is its ability to weigh in motion. Weighing in motion um, allows vehicles <clears throat> to pass through uh, the weighment more quickly than they would if they each had to stop and be weighed statically. This saves time and congestion at the site. The scale can accurately and reliably weigh vehicles at up to 15 miles per hour, but keep in mind that as the speed goes up, the accuracy is going to go down, and we'll talk about that in a second. So how accurate uh, should the user expect this scale to be? Well, the user can expect 1%, uh, plus or minus 1% accuracy at speeds of up to 6 miles an hour. Like I said, as speed goes up, accuracy will decrease slightly, and we'll talk about that here in a second. There's two reasons for it. Uh, a is because the faster the vehicle's traveling, the more dynamic forces are involved in the suspension. But B, it comes down to software as well. Here's some examples of the accuracies you should expect at different speeds. So, inside the 825, the dynamic software is sampling the load cells at a rate of 200 samples per second. 
So for any one second that the tire is on the weigh bridge, you'll get 200 samples in order to calculate a weight. Because the weigh bridge is only 30 inches across, we can do a calculation here and you'll see at two miles an hour, the vehicle's traveling at three feet, three feet per second, which means that axle is only applying force to the bridge for about 0.8 seconds. During that time, we can capture 166 samples. That's a good amount of samples uh, to use to calibrate the dynamic weight. Now let's look at 15 miles an hour. 15 miles per hour, the vehicle is traveling at 22 feet per second, and that axle is only applying weight to the ray bridge for about a tenth of a second, giving us 23 samples. Inside the, the indicator, the software is taking those samples and it's doing two filtering processes to them. A, it's filtering off the weight readings that are rising and falling as the scale, as the force is applied to the scale, the weight comes up, it's gonna level off. As the axle is on the scale and it's gonna drop off as it exits the scale. It's gonna filter off those ends and then it's gonna look for any spurious signals that are way outside uh, of the median reading. In this example here, uh, Possibly a couple readings uh, from the beginning of the sample are eliminated because they were rising. A few readings at the end of the sample are eliminated because they were on the falling end of the weighment. And then five samples were filtered out because they were spurious signals that fell outside of the average. What's left is, let's say, 160 usable samples. Put your average together for the dynamic weight reading for that axle. Let's look at 15 miles an hour, however. At 15 miles an hour, the axle is only on the scale for about a tenth of a second. We get 23 samples, we filter out two or three, and as you can see, we've got a lot less to work with when we're looking for our average. Therefore, you're gonna have a little less accuracy with the fewer samples than you might have with a higher number of samples at a high at a lower speed. So what are you going to see on the indicator? On the 825 indicator, you're going to see a record of every axle of that vehicle numbered sequentially like this and the calculated dynamic weight of that vehicle um, off to the right. There is, there are presets inside of the indicator where the user can set uh, a limit as to how much weight is acceptable for any one axle or gross. As long as the weights being seen are below that limit, you're gonna get uh, weights in green. If the weight were to exceed the preset limit, you're going to see a weight in red. That's true of the gross as well. In addition, it's going to keep track of total counts, uh, vehicles weighed that day, um, total counts of overweight axles and overweight trucks, and so on. There's uh, any number of, uh, of features you can incorporate to, to track the record you're capturing with your weigh in motion scale. Another advantage and, and an interesting feature of, of a weigh in motion scale is that because it's capturing each axle individually and then totaling the sum of all those individual axles for a gross weight, you basically have no limit to the amount of gross weight that the scale uh, can capture. So for example, you go across the scale with a five axle vehicle and each axle weighs 16,000 pounds, you're gonna get a gross reading of five 16,000 pound axles and a gross of 80,000 pounds. But hypothetically, you could drive across a scale with 
a hundred axle vehicle. Let's say it's just a train of trailers behind this, uh, this truck. Say every axle weighs 16,000 pounds like before, but this time there's a hundred of them. The gross reading on the indicator is going to be 1.6 million. It's going to be a seven digit weight on the bottom of your indicator, which is kind of unique because that's a capability that static scales are not going to be able to offer. In addition, if you need the accuracy of a static weighment, uh, you can switch the indicator over to static weighing mode and use the SWIM just like you would a conventional static axle weigher. Um, in that mode, you've got NTEP approved load cells, NTEP approved indicator. Don't confuse that with the scale being legal for trade. It still will not be legal for trade in static mode, but you're going to get tolerances that are within NIST class 3 which means it's going to be just as accurate as any static scale um, that you're going to use. Quality. Uh, again, Cardinal's got 50 plus years of experience making long-lasting, durable, static truck scales. We've applied that same technology to this way in motion product. It's a solid steel welded structure and it's designed with performance and longevity in mind. The Weybridge itself is a half inch steel, half inch thick steel plate, which rides on two eight by 10 square tubes, each of which has quarter inch sidewalls and are connected every two feet with a 10 inch wide, quarter inch thick steel rib. The thing is built like a tank no other way in motion scale that's going to be as robust and as durable as this scale. Under the scale, as we mentioned before, are four SCA load cells. These are compression style load cells. The same load cells we're already using and have been uh, for years in our static truck scale. They're the load cells that our customers and our dealers are already familiar with. But the advantage to using this compression style cell in a way in motion application is A, uh, most of our competitors are using a much lighter load cell, uh, 25K maybe at best, uh, some of them even lighter load cells. B, our competition uh, is using shear beam load cells. Uh, because they're lighter load cells in a shear beam style, you're getting a lot more deflection in those cells. Um, that deflection is going to cause a lower resonance, and those vibrations are going to be reflected as spurious weight signals, which are going to be harder to filter out than they will be in our system, where we've got a compression style cell, very little deflection, very high resonance, and therefore very few spurious weight signals that we have to worry about skewing our measurement. As with all of Cardinal's truck scales, um, the metal uh, parts of the bridge and lower frame are powder coated, which is gonna provide a long lasting, low maintenance, corrosion free finish. So to recap, If a dealer buys one of our slow weigh in motion scale scales, he's getting a long lasting product, very low maintenance, four load cells, one indicator, <clears throat> very robust, high resonant frequency, which is going to cause more efficient filtering and higher accuracy than our competition, and a happy customer. The standard SWIM, as listed in our catalog, comes with the following items. The dealer calls in, orders an SWIM, right out of the catalog, it's going to be the lower frame and weigh bridge, and checking of course, the four SCA load cells, an 825 desk mount indicator, like you see here, 
with the SWIM software, with the dynamic weighing application software, P600 ticket printer, and a loop detector. We'll discuss the loop detector in a second. <clears throat> As it stands today, the catalog list for this product is $19,599, <clears throat> which makes it by itself a pretty low cost static scale, especially considering all of its features and capabilities. <clears throat> but in addition to the low cost of the equipment, there's very little concrete or rebar required in this installation. You've got a very small pit, 16 feet by 5 feet. There's minimal concrete formwork on the installation because the lower frame itself becomes the concrete form it's cast into place. And all of this results in a very affordable scale uh, with axle weighing capabilities, weigh in motion capabilities, low installation cost, uh, low life cycle costs. There's just a lot of benefits to going this way. Again, if, way, if legal for trade is not required. Again, advantages, highly accurate, it saves time, there's a small footprint, and there's, we don't need a lot of real estate to install this scale, which is important. Uh, there's very low maintenance, there aren't a lot of load cells or, or uh, parts to maintain in this scale, and there's a minimum cost for both the equipment and the installation. So now we have a good understanding of what the SWIM is and how it works, we're going to look at some additional components that might need to be added to a standard system to provide the capabilities that the user needs. There's any number of peripheral devices that may be added. Um, In-road sensors might be installed uh, to detect off-scale um, of a vehicle if the vehicle does not pass over the scale directly, it could alert the user that that was not a good weighment. The in-road sensors could be uh, used to determine speed, which on its own, the SWIM uh, will not give you a speed reading, but with the addition of sensors that could be achieved. You could add vehicle recording software, traffic control devices. If you're using this as a screening process, you might want to put up a stoplight or a directional arrow to direct trucks based on their uh, dynamic weight. You could have a driver display like an SB500, uh, ticket printers, cameras, license plate readers, the list goes on. So again, and we've had some confusion about this because of the way it's in our catalog, when you buy a slow way in motion at the starting price, it comes with a desktop 825. This indicator is going to need to be housed in an enclosure, so a scale house needs to be nearby. If a scale house is not available, you can upgrade to a SAT 825 outdoor enclosure, in which case from there you can do almost anything. You could com you can communicate remotely uh, with uh, a building or a recording software. It could be unattended. Um, obviously, it's, it's housed in a weatherproof enclosure, so you don't have the expense of a scale house. Users might be interested in adding a SB500 or SB250 remote display. Again, here's an example of an application where traffic lights are involved and that's just an example of a typical workflow the indicator talking to the traffic control and the remote display and the printer no other hardware is required <clears throat> you might add an alarm um, there's applications where the user wants an audible alarm if the truck is overweight. That can be easily added. Add a PC for vehicle recording software. 
This is an example of uh, vehicle recording software and what it might look like if uh, you were recording weigh in motion weights. Here's an example of a site with a overview and license plate reading camera. Again, some users need or want photographic evidence of that truck as it was being weighed to tie those two records together. Overheight detection is, is a common um, peripheral device that's added. You know, if a, if a user is checking the axle weights and checking gross weights to make sure that vehicle is legal before it enters the highway, for very little additional cost, they can check uh, if the vehicle is over height as well. Now that we've discussed the, the product and the peripheral devices, let's uh, talk a little bit about the installation and site considerations. So, you know you want a weigh in motion product. Now, where do we put it? Again, the weigh bridge itself is, is minimal. Um, the entire bridge and concrete pit is only gonna take up uh, a space that needs to be excavated that's 16 feet by five feet. Of course, once the concrete is poured, the scale itself is only gonna be about 14 feet by three feet. But we need to take into account this here. This is the loop detector. Some of you might have been wondering, how does the scale know when one vehicle stops and the next one starts? All the indicator needs is a binary on or off input for this. It could be done with a laser, but more commonly a loop detector is used. A loop detector, if you're not familiar, is basically a coil of wire which is embedded in the road. This can be done by simply making uh, saw cuts in the shape you see there on the screen. Coil the wire, seal the saw cuts with the loop sealant. By the way, loop sealant is provided with the SWIM when it's purchased from Cardinal. That loop coil runs back to a loop detector. The loop detector basically puts a small current through the coil of wire, which turns it into a weak magnet, which is able to detect the presence of metal um, over the loop. By its nature, the scale is constantly ready to receive a weight. As it's just sitting there idly, you do not have to touch anything, you don't have to be around, if weight comes on the scale and exceeds the on threshold, meaning you set a threshold so if someone just walks across, it's not going to register. Say you set a threshold, an on threshold of 10,000 pounds or 6,000 pounds. If the on threshold of weight is reached, it begins reading. As that axle crosses the scale, that weighment is recorded as axle one, and then the vehicle comes over the top of this loop detector. The loop detector tells the system, hey, there is a vehicle present. The system continues to capture axle weights as each axle crosses the bridge until eventually the rear bumper of the trailer is going to go past the loop detector, and that trigger is gonna drop out. It's gonna tell the indicator, okay, there's no vehicle here. At that point, the vehicle is gonna record that as one vehicle, one weighment. It's gonna to total the gross weights, and it's gonna move on and be ready for the next vehicle immediately. Typically, uh, if we're thinking about space concerns, uh, the inductive loop is six feet across. The leading edge of the loop 
we recommend it being four feet past the trailing edge of the scale. That's not a critical measurement. It could be moved a little further away, a little closer. Just understand that the loop is not gonna signal the indicator to stop the weighment uh, until the vehicle is passed. So if this loop's further away, you're gonna have a longer lag. If the loop detector's closer, you're gonna have a, a quicker um, gross total on the vehicle. You'll also notice uh, here on the side uh, is this box here in this drawing. We do not put the trim board or the loop detector under the scale. This is a uh, this is only a 15 inch deep uh, pit under the scale. So to protect the scale from or the the trim board and the loop detector from water, we put it inside an enclosure. This is a small stainless steel enclosure. It will, again, it will come with the scale. Um, there's some advantages to this. A, obviously it protects the equipment from water. B, it means the scale tech doesn't have to get under the scale uh, to access the trim board or troubleshoot the loop detector if there's ever a problem. He can stand comfortably uh, out of traffic, out of the roadway, uh, outdoors, and uh, make his adjustments. It doesn't have to be, uh, the trim board does not have to be placed on a pole here. If there was a scale building nearby, of course the loop detector and the trim uh, board could be installed in the scale building. We just recommend that it's uh, installed within 20 feet of the scale. And that's just due to the, the length of uh, load cell cables. Okay, so now we, need ha we know how much space we need to install one of these scales. Uh, let's talk about this site conditions. Um, warning, there are always dynamic forces at play on a moving vehicle. Uh, the following situations need to be mitigated uh, in your installation. Here's an example of a, of a poor installation where the scale is standing a little bit proud of the road. This might also occur if the approaches on both sides of the scale were asphalt and over time the asphalt were to rut out. Um, if the scale is standing proud of the road, obviously when a axle is on that scale, it's suspension is going to be more compressed than the other axles. More compression is going to e equal more load. In this kind of a situation, the scale is going to reflect a higher uh, weight than would be a true static weight because every axle is getting a little extra pressure on it because of the way the suspension gets compressed. Vice versa, a scale that is sunk into the roadway is going to weigh a little bit light. These aren't deal breakers, you know. It, it's to be to be so much that it needs to be a real concern. You would have to have several inches of difference. But when we're talking about trying to hit fractions of percent on accuracy, these are all things that can affect uh, the accuracy. In this situation, as the scale sits below the surface. <clears throat> The axle on the scale is going to be <clears throat> going to have suspension that's compressed a little less, and that truck's going to weigh lighter than its true static weight. Grade. The scale, and we get this question a lot, the scale does not have to be installed on a level surface, but it does need to be installed along the same grade. Now that, that grade could be up to 5%. We recommend 2% and 2% is the standard for uh, rainwater drainage off a of site. Um, roads are have a crown in them of 2%, otherwise you'd have puddles on your road obviously. Uh, but, but up to 5% is okay and that's in either orientation, either uh, cross slope um, or front to back. What you want to avoid is Changing the plane the vehicle is on at any point during the approach or exit of the scale. In other words, during the entire weighment, that truck needs to remain on the same plane. Here's an example of why. Say the truck's going downhill and entering the scale. You'll see here the center of gravity and the weight is going to be shifted forward in that truck. 
as it comes on the scale and the front of that truck is going to weigh a little heavier. Again, we might only be talking about a fraction of a percent. It just depends on the severity, but it is a measurable amount. <clears throat> Here again, if the truck was exiting the scale and headed uphill, the weight on that trailer is going to be shifted toward the back and you're going to get an artificially high reading on the uh, rear tandems. Again, coming uphill, you'll see the front axles are going to be a little less compressed. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, the front suspension is going to be a little less compressed, which is going to give you a little lighter load. Depending on the severity, it may not be an issue, but it needs to be considered. Uh, in a static application, obviously this wouldn't, this wouldn't matter. If we were weighing all five of those axles simultaneously on, um, on an axle scale, we would get a true gross weight. Yeah, the, the, the back axles may be a little heavier than it would be on a level, but the gross would remain the same. That's not gonna be true in a weigh in motion scale because you're only capturing axle weights when that axle is positioned over the scale. Uh, there's situations where the weight could be shifted either on or off of that axle at that time. Here's an example of the truck going downhill. That rear tandem, that first, uh, the leading axle in the rear tandem is gonna weigh a little heavier and the one in the back is gonna weigh a little light because the trailers rock forward slightly. Uh, braking is also a concern. Uh, users need to keep in mind that any braking or accelerating over the scale is going to cause uh, the weights to either increase or decrease that weight's shifting, like we said. Uh, braking's gonna shift the weight forward, accelerating's gonna shift the weight back. <clears throat> and most importantly, you wanna minimize any oscillation of the load as it's crossing the scale. Because of that, you need to think about any rutting, uh, potholes, uneven surfaces, uh, changes in the plane of the chassis as it enters or exits the scale, anything that would cause it to, to op, the load to oscillate or sway back and forth, which A, this is going to happen, uh, this is going to be more exaggerated at higher speeds. It's another reason higher speeds uh, means a little less accuracy. Um, but this is going to cause probably the most uh, opportunity for there to be air in your weighment. Uh, we could see up to 5% error at 10 kilometers an hour uh, if that trailer was was swaying back and forth um, very uh, very in a, in a very exaggerated way. So here are the site considerations that need to be uh, taken into account before you install this weigh in motion scale. The vehicle needs to approach. This is on that sheet I handed out as well. The vehicle needs to approach and exit the scale in a straight line. Turning, the vehicle turning on the scale, again, is going to uh, shift the load and give you a, an inaccurate uh, weighment. <clears throat> again, it, it might only be a fraction of percent, but it needs to be considered. All efforts should be made to avoid conditions that would cause the vehicle to rock or sway or the suspension to be excited in any way, which requires the pavement to be in good condition before and beyond the scale. And the vehicle should remain in a constant grade during the entire weighment. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that slow speed scales do not do very well. And this is true of everyone's slow speed scale, it's not just Cardinal. A single platform slow speed scale is not going to capture speed. We don't have another reference point. All we have is, is one platform. <clears throat> so without anything to judge a time over distance uh, measurement from, we're not going to get a vehicle speed. Because we don't have vehicle speed, we can't calculate spacing on axles. Again, this is true of any single platform way in motion, so keep that in mind. 
Um, because you can't calculate distances between axles, the system as it stands uh, here on this table, an indicator and a single way bridge, it is not going to be possible to automatically classify that vehicle. So if you need to know if that vehicle is a class four, five, six, seven, based on axle spacing, we need to look at adding something into the system that can help us to calculate speed. Keep that in mind. So shipping. Um, we get this question often. Uh, customers want shipping costs or shipping estimates. Um, if you're quoting or trying to figure shipping costs for this scale, uh, I would use the following measurements. The scale is 14 feet by 3 feet, 1.5 feet deep, and roughly 6,500 6, pounds. The scale and equipment comes with our standard a one-year warranty against defect, defects uh, in materials and workmanship. But here at Cardinal, we stand by our products, of course. And uh, because this is a single source product, um, we're all standing by. If there was ever a, a issue arise with the customer, we'd be ready to respond rapidly. If you're not already aware, uh, Cardinal has a WIM specific website. Uh, you can direct customers here uh, or, you, or you can go here yourself if you're interested. And uh, on our website you can see more of our WIM offerings as well as a uh, version of this PowerPoint presentation, 3D renderings of our scale, uh, examples of the 825 indicator with the dynamic display. Uh, view optional peripheral devices. So what we've set up here is a model, a 1 16th scale model of our s wim scale. The indicator is the 825. This is their, our uh, typical 825 but with a dynamic weighing application. The software in here for this model is the same software that comes with our full-size swim scale. Also connected is a P600 ticket printer. Again, this comes standard with our slow speed weigh in motion. And then our weigh bridge here is, uh, well, it's just a model weigh bridge. We're using very small five pound capacity shear beam load cells instead of our 50K SDA. All right, 50K SDA is not gonna fit underneath this piece of plywood, but what is good about this is it will actually work and we've calibrated the uh, indicator so that 20 pounds of actual weight will reflect here at 80,000 pounds. So we're going to get something similar to actual commercial truck axle loads as we push this across the scale. As you see the way the indicator is sitting now, <clears throat> uh, right before we started filming, I was showing someone else that there's an unlimited number of axles that can be accumulated. Uh, so what you see on the screen now is a weight for a 17 axle vehicle, uh, gross weight of almost 400,000 pounds. But that is going to remain on the screen until the next, the axle of the next vehicle comes onto the scale. What you'll see is as soon as the axle comes on that scale, it's going to clear that and start weighing. I don't have to touch anything. Uh, just by default, it's sitting there waiting to receive information. So the scale crosses in motion. Again, this is a 1 16th scale, so the speed is also 1 16th speed. Um, axle 1 crosses in motion. It never stops, and you'll see we get axle 1 weight on the indicator. At this point in real life, the front of the vehicle would be over the loop detector. The loop detector, which will look like this, because this is a loop detector, <clears throat> will tell the indicator that a vehicle is present. The vehicle continues to roll forward, the second axle crosses, and the third axle crosses. You'll see axles two and three on the indicator. 
do not let this second axle here on the truck confuse you. This is just a tag wheel. It doesn't touch the ground. This is just the model we happen to have. So <clears throat> the vehicle continues to roll forward. The fourth and fifth axles cross the scale. You'll see on the indicator, axles four and five are displayed. And as the truck would in real life continue to move forward, it's going to pass the loop detector. The loop detector is going to sense there's no more vehicle present. It's going to trigger the 825, that that's the end of the weighment. For the purposes of this model, I've simply installed a momentary contact switch on the top of the indicator. It's just an on off signal. Uh, you'll see on the bottom of the screen, you probably can't see it in the video, but it does say loop on and loop off as that loop's triggered. By default, the indicator will send a signal to the P600 printer to print a ticket, which we've got here. And the basic uh, ticket is going to reflect a time, a date, the number of axles, the axle weights of each of those, and then a gross total at the bottom. You'll see on the indicator, overweight axles. I think in this case, we have a preset limit of 15,000 pounds. Um, if any individual axle is over 15,000 pounds, it's reflected there in red. The user can adjust that preset limit to whatever they want. Axle one, legal. Axle two, over the axle limit. Axles three and four, fine, legal. Axle five, over 15,000 pounds, it displays in red. But the gross weight is still below uh, the preset. In this case, we have 80,000 pounds set as the preset legal limit, which is the legal limit on US highways. Uh, the gross weight here is still within legal limits, so it's uh, displayed in yellow. If that was overweight, and I can simulate that very quickly by just tapping the scale. Again, it was already right away. I'm just using my finger. I'll show you. I'm just using my finger to tap the scale on and off. I never, it's not a static wave and I'm just tapping it. I'm getting axles accumulated. And see, as the gross weight goes over 80,000 pounds, it starts to display in red. This is also a good time to show you the uh, feature of how there is no limit to the individual axles that can be uh, sum, accumulated and, and summed on, on this system. In fact, uh, just a little while ago, out of curiosity, we, we tapped the scale until we had uh, nearly 50 axles recorded and uh, the gross total weight went into the seven digits. It was over a million pounds gross weight. <clears throat> of course, you hit the loop detector, that tells the indicator that weighment's over. You get a ticket printed. 22 axles on the ticket and a gross weight of 455,000 pounds. So hopefully that helps to explain how the system works and what you can expect with your Cardinal S1 scale. Thank you.